uh, please, let's give the floor to a, a foreign journalist, CNN. Hi, um, Matthew Chance from CNN. Thank you very much for giving me this question. Uh, first of all, could you characterize the dynamic between yourself and President Biden? Was it hostile or was it friendly? And secondly, throughout these conversations, did you commit to ceasing carrying out cyber attacks on the United States? Did you commit to stopping threatening Ukraine's security? And did you commit to stop cracking down on the opposition <coughs> in Russia? As for the first general appraisal, I think there was no hostility, quite the contrary. Our meeting took place, principally speaking, many of our positions. We don't share the same positions in many areas, but I think that both of these sides showed a willingness to understand one another and to find ways to bring our positions closer together. The talks were quite constructive. <coughs> As for cybersecurity, we reached an agreement, chiefly that we will start negotiations on that. I think that's extremely important. Now, as for who needs to take on any sort of commitment, I'd like to inform you of something. I'm talking about something that's already well known, but not known to the broader public not from American sources. I'm, I'm afraid that I'll confuse the names of organizations, uh, but as for American sources, they've said that most of the cyber attacks in the world are carried out from the cyber realm of the United States. In second place is Canada, afterwards Latin American countries, and then comes Great Britain. Russia on this list. Where's Russia on this list? Well, we are a country whose cyber territory has the, the most... Uh, the, Russia's not on the list, number one. Second, secondly, <coughs> we've received from the United States 10 requests regarding cyber attacks on attacks in the United States. As our colleagues have told us, they are from the cyber realm of Russia. And there were two requests this year, both last year and this year. Our colleagues have received exhaustive responses. For our part, Russia last year sent in accordance, uh, sent to the state structures of the U.S. 40, over 40, and uh, 35 this year, and we still haven't even received a single response on that front. This says that we do have something to work on. And the question of who, to what degree, needs to take on responsibility, that should be resolved during the negotiation process. We're going to start consultations. What we think is that when it comes to cybersecurity, uh, cybersecurity is incredibly important in the world in general, and specifically for the United Nations, and it's also important for Russia to the same extent. I'll give you an example. We know that there were cyber attacks on a pipeline company in the United States. We also know that the company was compelled to pay five million to the blackmailers. Uh, some of the money, I believe, has already been returned, according to my sources, uh, which was paid electronically, but some of it has not been returned. And what, what, is, what do the state organs of Russia have to do with that? We are encountering the same threats. For example, when it comes to the healthcare system of one of the big regions of the Russian Federation. And we see that this work is being coordinated from cyber, the cyber realm of the United States. Uh, I don't think that the United States, that the official authorities have any interest in such type of, in such types of manipulation, manipulations. But I think just throwing out these insinuations at the expert level, that's, that's inappropriate. We should sit and start working. That's in the interest of the United States and the Russian Federation. In principle, we've reached agreement about that, and Russia is prepared to do it. Let's continue. RT. RT. 
RT, give the microphone to RT, please. Please give the microphone to or, or some, of, was some of the question not answered. So there were two other parts of the question. The first one is, did you commit in these meetings to stop threatening Ukraine? Remember the reason this summit was called in the first place, or the timing of it, was when Russia was building up lots of forces across the world from Ukraine. And the second, second part of the question, the third part of the question, was did you commit to stopping your crackdown against the opposition groups inside Russia led by Alexei Navalny? <laughs> So, well, I, I didn't hear that part of the question, maybe it wasn't interpreted, or maybe uh, you just decided to ask a second question. Let's turn now to commitments under the Ukraine. We only have one commitment, promoting the implementation of the Minsk agreements. If the Russian side is prepared to do it, then we will take that path without any doubt. Incidentally, I'd like to point out one point. Back in November of last year, what happened? The Ukrainian delegation submitted their considerations about how they are planning to implement the Minsk Accords. Please, take a look. It's not a secret document. Here's what it says. Primarily, uh, there's a need to have proposals for the political integration of Donbass into the Ukrainian legal system and constitution. To do that, there'll be a need for a constitutional amendment, as that's what it says. Number one. And number two, the border between the Russian Federation and Ukraine in the, along the line of Donbass will be occupied by the, the border forces of uh, Ukraine on the day after the election. What did Ukraine propose? as a first step, returning the armed forces of Ukraine to its, to its th their place of constant deployment. What does that mean? That means that the Ukrainian forces should go to Donbass. That's number one. The second thing that they proposed was closing the border, the border between Russia and Ukraine in this area. And third, elections should be held in three months, and three months after these two steps are taken. You don't need to be an attorney. You don't need to have any special education to understand that that has nothing to do with the Minsk agreements. This runs fully counter to the Minsk agreements. That's why what additional commitments could Russia shoulder in this context? I think everything is understandable. Turning now to the exercises, we are conducting exercises on our own territory, just like the United States carries out exercises, a lot of exercises on their territory, but we don't, we didn't carry any uh, exercises uh, bringing our personnel and our equipment to the United States. Regrettably, the Russian, uh, the United States government is doing that right now. That's why the concerns should be not uh, with, with Russia, but with the United, United States. But uh, we talked about that during our, well, during our talks, we clarified our positions. Turning now to the opposition and the citizen that you mentioned. Number one, this person knew that he was breaching the laws effective in Russia. He should have noted that as a person who was convicted two times. I'd like to underscore that he deliberately ignored the requirements of the laws. Uh, this person went abroad for treatment, and uh, he didn't register with the authorities, and he went to, went, came out of the hospital, and then he recorded a video, posting it in the internet. And then that requirement, uh, that requirement arrived. He didn't appear. He ignored the law, and he was then. He, he knew that he was then uh, being investigated, and he came back deliberately. He did what he wanted to do. That's why. What can you say? As for people like him and the systemic opposition, regrettably the format of the press conference does not allow for us to get into this in depth, but here's what I have to say. Look, I think I'm not going to say anything complicated. It's going to be clearly understandable. If, if you can convey this objectively to your viewers, your audience, then I'll be very grateful to, to you. The United States 
has announced that Russia is its enemy, its adversary. The Congress did that in 2017. The U.S. legislation has a provision. That provision says that the U.S. needs to support the rules in the order of democratic administration in our country and needs to support political organizations. That is enshrined in American law, American law, the U.S. law. Now let's ask a question. If Russia is an enemy, then what organizations will support America in Russia? I don't think the ones that are strengthening the Russian Federation will do that. I think it's going to be those who are restraining it. And that is the objective of the United States, publicly stated objective. Or organizing people who are promoting the implementation of Russian policy, or of American policy in, toward Russia, rather. And what, how should we feel about that? I think it's clear that we should be cautious about it. But we are going to act exclusively within the confines of Russian law.